Section 18 of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gilles G. Leblanc. Women of History by Anonymous. Olga, 500. Gibbon. A female, perhaps of the basest origin, who could avenge the death and assume the sceptre of her husband Igor, must have been endowed with those active virtues which command the fear and obedience of barbarians. In a moment of foreign and domestic peace, she sailed from Kyo to Constantinople, and the Emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus has described with minute diligence the ceremonial of her reception in his capital and palace. The steps, the titles, the salutations, the banquet, the presents, were exquisitely adjusted to gratify the vanity of the stranger, with due reverence to the superior majesty of the purple. In the sacrament of baptism she received the venerable name of the Empress Helena, and her conversion might be preceded or followed by her uncle, two interpreters, sixteen damsels of a higher and eighteen of a lower rank, twenty-two domestics or ministers, and forty-four Russian merchants, who composed the retinue of the great Princess Olga. After her return to Kyo in Novogorod, she firmly persisted in her new religion, but her labors in the propagation of the gospel were not crowned with success, and both her family and nation adhered with obstinacy or indifference to the gods of their fathers. Her son, Swadoslas, was apprehensive of the scorn and ridicule of his companions, and her grandson, Wolodomir, devoted his youthful zeal to multiply and decorate the monuments of ancient worship. The savage deities of the north were still propitiated with human sacrifices. In the choice of the victim, a citizen was preferred to a stranger, a Christian to an idolater, and the father, who defended his son from the sacerdotal knife, was involved in the same doom by the rage of the fanatic tumult. Yet the lessons and example of the pious Olga had made a deep though secret impression on the minds of the prince and people. The Greek missionaries continued to preach, to dispute, and to baptize, and the ambassadors or merchants of Russia compared the idolatry of the woods with the elegant superstition of Constantinople. They had gazed with admiration on the domes of St. Sophia, the lively pictures of saints and martyrs, the riches of the altar, the number and vestments of the priests, the pomp and order of the ceremonies. They were edified by the alternate succession of devout silence and harmonious song. Nor was it difficult to dissuade them that a choir of angels descended each day from heaven to join in the devotion of the Christians. But the conversion of Wolodomir was determined or hastened by his desire of a Roman bride. At the same time, and in the city of Cherson, the rites of baptism and marriage were celebrated by the Christian pontiff, the city he restored to the emperor Basil, the brother of his spouse, but the brazen gates were transported, as it is said, to Novogorod, and erected before the first church as a trophy of his victory and faith. At his despotic command, Perun, the god of thunder, whom he had so long adored, was dragged through the streets of Kyo, and twelve sturdy barbarians battered with clubs the mishappen image, which was indignantly cast into the waters of the Boristanese. The edict of Wolodomir had proclaimed that all who should refuse the rites of baptism should be treated as the enemies of God and their prince, and the rivers were instantly filled by many thousands of obedient Russians, who acquiesced in the truth and excellence of a doctrine which had been embraced by the great duke and his boyars. In the next generation the relics of paganism were finally extirpated, and all this resulted from the baptism of Olga, which may be fixed as the era of Russian Christianity. End of section 18